the aquatic side. I really focus on the terrestrial yeah, side. Yeah, I think that I think we have okay. a lot of uh, sound aficionados here. So yeah, so I so I'm not going to push it up against the wall. I've left a good <laughs> chunk of time, so there's no rush on my end. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started with your introduction. And Liz, thanks for, for joining us um, today here with our, uh, this is actually our, our last uh, scheduled seminar of the spring semester uh, for CARE. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time out today to share your science with us. Uh, by way of introduction for everybody who's, who's joined us, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Jerry Berry here. She uh, graduated in 2000 from the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at Princeton University, where she completed a senior thesis on the fitness consequences of parasites in natural populations of white crowned sparrows. And I think you'll see some of those today in her talk. Um, she then went on to do her doctoral dissertation work on the patterns and mechanisms of song evolution in the same species uh, in the Nowicki lab uh, at Duke University. Uh, and then in 2007, she joined the Museum of Natural uh, Science at Louisiana State University uh, they're studying the lineage diversification in neotropical oven birds and wood creepers. For those of you that are uh, uh, avian fans, you'll know which groups I'm talking about there. And then in 2012, she joined the T uh, Tulane EE Bio faculty, and then in 2017, joined the EB faculty at the University of Knoxville, Tennessee, where she's at now. She's currently working there on several different collaborative projects that address the proximate and the ultimate factors controlling variation and acoustic communication signals employing a range of different interdisciplinary approaches to her uh, techniques uh, in her study. So today, uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Berry is joining us and she's giving a talk that's entitled Singing in a Silent Spring, Urban Songbird Responses to the COVID-19 Shutdown Soundscape. Liz, thanks for joining us today. And thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here um, and to give a talk at your new center, CARE. This is it's always exciting to see um, researchers come together to think about the soundscape, whether it's terrestrial or marine. Uh, so I'm very excited to talk to folks about this work. And of course, as Dan mentioned, I've been working on white crown sparrows now since 1999. <laughs> as my sister-in-law always asks me, how can you still be learning anything new? from the same bird. And yet here we are. So um, you can, you can keep studying the same thing for a long time uh, and keep learning new things. So today I wanna to tell you about our work, uh, mainly our work from last year during COVID-19. But before we get into that, I wanna back up a little bit and just give some background about what you know is known about the soundscape and specifically urban soundscapes in cities and so um, that's where i'm going to start and then we'll go into the actual questions in the system uh, for this talk today so this is a picture of Tioga Pass. <laughs> so this is a picture of where I did my undergraduate research. I always start here just in case there are students uh, on this uh, on the talk at the talk because I think it's really important to have these hands-on experiences as a student. It's what got me started. So I was working as a field assistant for a postdoc who was interested in blood parasites, uh, malaria, and how that affected. Um, fitness in these birds and also things like altitudinal migration. And of course, you know, I was I was learning lots of things like netting and banding and handling birds and collecting blood and doing slides. I think I've scored thousands of slides, blood slides now. Um, but the whole time I kept listening to this bird sing and I was so excited about its song uh, that I went on to do my PhD on this. Uh, so here's a white crown sparrow singing. So that's his song. It's relatively simple. It's relatively short. It's comparatively loud. And it's a long distance signal. And in many songbirds, their song is a long distance signal. And it has two functions primarily. This male is singing to attract a mate, to attract a female. And he's also singing to defend his territory. It's a keep out signal. So it's a what we call a dual function signal. So when we think about this song and how it may change or evolve over time, we need to think about that in the context of its, of its function, what it's used for. And so I'm gonna come back to that as I talk today. So because it's a long distance signal, one of the things that shapes the evolution of this song 
is the environment in which the bird finds itself? And this is a question I've been thinking about in a lot of different ways for like a couple decades now. <laughs> uh, and this important hypothesis that sort of what we think about is called signal detection theory. But before I go into this sort of theory about how the environment shapes song, I want to talk about song as a phenotype. So we just heard this sound, and a lot of people always ask me, well, that's nice, but how do you quantify that behavior, right? So what we can do is we can record this song, and then we can actually do with fast Fourier analysis, we can do what's these spectrograms, or these visual representations of sound. And here I'm showing one form of that time on the x-axis and frequency on the y-axis. So this is the song we just heard that male singing. It's really these sort of pure tones here at the beginning with a sort of long held note or a whistle on this little more complicated note called a complex. And we can, and this sort of two little buzzies right here. And what's interesting about white crowned sparrows is most males just sing this one song. Most males in a population sing the same song but different populations have different songs. So they have what are called dialects, much like we do. And this really sort of discrete geographic pattern to phenotypic variation in their song. And so we can categorize this. We can do this um, by grouping notes into things like a whistle or a complex or a buzz. We can also collect um, other types of data from the song, such as frequency and duration characteristics. So here um, I've shown the maximum frequency of this song and the minimum frequency. We can subtract those and calculate what's known as the frequency bandwidth, or we can even look at sort of the length of these different notes, such as the duration, right? Or the rate at which they're producing those sounds. So these kinds of um, quantitative measures we can use to categorize and characterize things like individual variation in song, population level variation, and even um, different similarities, sort of differences uh, between different species. So these types of measures are sort of fundamental to how we capture information about this behavior. So back to my signal detection theory. So when we think about these ideas of song as a long distance signal, we have to think about the habitat in which this bird is singing because a sound moves through, right, as it moves between the signaler and the receiver, we know that it's going to encounter different things in the environment. So, for example, um, things like the density of vegetation that's around this bird. Uh, sound can reflect off of surfaces, uh, leaf surfaces, uh, create reverberation. Uh, we expect that as sound moves through the air, that sort of higher frequencies attenuate more quickly lower frequencies. And so these kinds of factors um, in the environment can shape these signals, because we imagine that selection is going to act on um, this communication, right, such that it's going to favor signalers, signals, and sort of receiver sensory systems that maximize the signal to noise ratio at any given place, and thus the sort of um, increasing information transfer, right, because we have, you know, this, this function, both in terms of a keep out signal and a mate attraction signal, that's information to be able to um, evaluate the signaler. So selection is going to act in ways that are sort of maximizing that communication between the signaler and the receiver. So because of this, we can expect that sound is going, songs are going to sound different in different environments. We might imagine that in a really dense vegetated area that we're going to find species who tend to have songs that are maybe slower, right? Notes are spaced further apart to uh, prevent reverberation from masking that information about the rate of note production. We can imagine that we might find um, things like lower, uh, you know, lower frequencies might be emphasized in sort of more densely vegetated areas that can transmit further through this dense vegetation. And so this is generally held up, right? We see this, there's been decades of research now showing this, uh, particularly in birds because their songs are so easy to record in lots of different locations. And we see that there's pretty good support that songs vary with their environment. Of course, we have another kind of habitat that we need to think about. So cities are what we might think of as an evolutionarily recent habitat. So we have here a map, a map of light at night, right? So this is showing us one type of sensory pollutant, light pollution. And what we do know about cities is that 
they're getting bigger, they're modifying habitat people, right? We're modifying habitat um, at a very rapid rate globally, right? Um, there's almost no place that's not touched by human hands at this point, uh, both on the land and in the sea, right? And so when we can think about this sort of really rapid change to habitat, um, albeit at a, at a rapid pace, it, it's not that different from the types of habitat modifications we see or habitat changes we've seen um, over evolutionary history. What is relatively new though, are things like light pollution and noise pollution, right? These are evolutionarily recent selective pressures on organisms that can affect things, any kind of sensory system, right? We think about, for example, bird song, but it can also do it in other modalities, such as like visual plumage when it comes to light. And because of these different sensory pollutants, this is sort of a city sort of provide an opportunity to look at really potentially rapid and contemporary evolution of animal communication signals. So here I should do that, that light map. So here's a noise map. So this is generated um, by the National Park Service relatively recently. Um, and what they did is they generated a noise map here for the United States. And in this map, what we're seeing is just noise here um, is down below and this gradation where the, the lighter the color, the higher the DBA. And so we can see you can probably use that just the noise alone to pick out your favorite city on this map. And so we see this really high concentrations of, of noise pollution, right? This is just, this is not natural sound, this is just human generated noise that's being mapped here. But if you look a little more closely, what you might start to see is that there's very few sites that are really quiet, right? So um, up in the Rockies and the Adirondacks here, we have this sort of islands of silence. But almost everywhere else, even when there's not really high levels of human population, we see these sort of transportation networks of noise uh, crisscrossing this landscape and fragmenting it, right? So noise is clearly, it's not just important in cities, it's everywhere, right? It's important, it's affecting all types of ecosystems. Hence the sort of more recent call to think about noise as a really important part of understanding an animal's ecological niche, right? It can't be ignored anywhere. And as a great paper that came out of this center that just came out, um, really emphasizes this also for oceans, right? It's not just terrestrial uh, areas that we need to think about soundscapes, but also in marine. And it clearly indicates that noise is affecting animals in many sublethal and maybe even lethal ways. But of course, what I'm really interested in is what does this song mean for our singing bird, right? So we had this bird singing sort of more natural habitat, thinking about how the environment shapes his signal. But in this case, we now have transplanted our bird, right? We're having a bird singing in the city. And one of the things that we know is ubiquitous is urban noise, right? So not and, you know, obviously the built structure is important, but I'm really interested in here thinking about human generated noise. As we can see in this picture, we can tell it's a city because there's all these cars, right? And so cars generate a lot of noise and this traffic noise um, should right, be influencing, affecting how this bird is singing. And we might expect that there's been behavioral adjustments or even adaptations to deal with, to maximize the signal to noise ratio in these given environments. And so a lot of work over the last 20 years has demonstrated that this is the case, right? So some of the first work was done um, at a Hans Slavikorn's lab in Europe, and he showed really nicely uh, in great tits across a paired series of urban rural pairs of um, areas in Europe, these great tits of breeding and you know, they're persisting in both urban areas as well as nearby rural areas. This pattern wherein they change how they're singing. So in more quiet areas, most of their song types may have the sort of low uh, minimum frequency to their song, but in more urban areas, they selectively sing song types from their repertoire that are higher minimum frequency. So, it's not that they're shifting their song up, but they're singing the song types that they've learned that are higher minimum frequency. And we find that this is, and as you can see here, there's also in the background, this sort of just noise, right? And human generated noise, which is shown here in the middle panel, has really high 
energy levels at low frequencies, right? That's that traffic noise. So I felt called the sort of low steady hum of traffic was in the background. And because this is at low frequencies, we can imagine that any signal that gets close to this can be overlap of masked by this noise. And so the one thought is that this shift up in minimum frequency is to reduce masking by low frequency human generated noise. We also see another type of adaptation, which is that birds sing with higher amplitude. And so this is known as the Lombard effect. Um, this is work that's been done pretty extensively out of uh, Brahms lab, also in Europe. And this, or it's also called the cocktail party effect, is why I have this picture here from Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> and, and the idea here is that when you have a party, when people come over and there's more and more people speaking, um, that the, it gets louder and louder in the room, the amplitude gets higher. And that what people do is they start to, not consciously, but they start to speak more loudly. And you also can get a register shift up in pitch. And so, of course, this is a really, makes sense, right? It gets louder, you sing louder. And we find that in a number of bird species. It's now been documented, I wanna say at least in 20, if not more. So again, we have this really nice documentation of a behavioral adjustment to noise. And one other way to maximize signal to noise is to have your signal at a higher amplitude. And we're seeing this in cities. And there's not pretty extensive evidence for these types of behavioral adjustments globally. So we can see here that all around the world, there's been a number of research studies over the last 20 years. These were reviewed in 2013. And I'm sure there's even a more recent review that's come out. This, this area of research is really uh, popping. And what it demonstrates is that there's pretty good evidence that a lot of birds, particularly songbirds, um, show these adjustments, such as shifting their minimum frequency, um, and they do this a couple different ways or singing at a higher amplitude. What's important to note though is that we don't see this in all species. So um, even in closely related species like these two flycatchers, we see evidence of the shift in one, but not in the other. So it's not ubiquitous. And in fact, it tends to be seen more often in birds that learn their song. So it's thought that that might be sort of this sort of ability to, for behavioral plasticity, right? And that there might be an ability to either adjust or adapt more rapidly um, in learning song, songbirds that learn their song in cities. There's also really good evidence that's building that these adjustments affect the salience of these signals. Now, what I mean by that is it affects how they're used in communication context. So remember I said it was a dual function signal. So we find really good evidence that these changes affect things like male-male competition. We find this both when we compare uh, male responses to songs from urban areas versus nearby rural areas, they discriminate. Um, so we start to see that some of these adjustments, these changes in different populations may be contributing to at least behavioral isolation between populations. It reduces the uh, sort of potency, we might say, of the signal in, a, in another even nearby population. We also find evidence from our, my own work that these adjustments, this response and discrimination can even occur within a population. So in urban areas, that males will even discriminate between songs that are adjusted to different degrees uh, in their minimum frequency. So these adjustments to noise are affecting the function of the signal, they're affecting communication. We also see this in the context of female mate choice, although this area is not as well studied because females are a pain, <laughs> they're very hard to study. Uh, you often have to bring them into the lab to ask them questions about preferences. And of course, once you get into a lab, you have other things that you have to think about that are affecting uh, these behaviors. So it gets a little trickier. Probably some of the best work has was been done by one of Hans's grad students, Rudolf Hafwick, who's now faculty in his own right. And he's shown really nicely in great tits that even in urban populations where males selectively sing these higher minimum frequency songs, females still prefer the low frequency song. Now this makes sense in a sexual selection context, lower frequency songs are indicating a, a male with a larger body size more often than not, but we have this sort of conflict between natural, selection, natural and sexual selection, right? We see the male shifting the song to increase the transmission distance, right? It's communication distance, um, but that might have some costs in the context of mate choice. So again, we have an, an example of an adjustment to noise affecting the, the function of this signal. 
there's also a lot of work now on how birds are doing this, right? How are they changing or adjusting their songs? Um, in songbirds, it's thought there's sort of two primary mechanisms. One is this idea of cultural evolution. Now, the idea here is that when males have this window early in development, when they're learning and memorizing songs, that they will selectively copy the songs that are less masked by noise, right? And so if they do that, then we can expect that across cultural generations, we could see a shift in the types of songs that are found in the population by learning alone. That's not genetic evolution, this is cultural evolution. And there's some evidence for this in natural populations with um, work I've done in swamp sparrows, as well as in urban populations. We had a paper come out not too long ago showing that this is the case in urban populations as well, where males are that are hand reared in the lab selectively copy the songs that are less masked by noise. So it's pretty good evidence that this cultural evolution can explain some of the variation, some of these adjustments that we're seeing in urban areas. There's also um, adult behavioral plasticity. So this is the idea that basically what I like to call immediate flexibility, that males can adjust their singing behavior in real time to fluctuations in human generated noise. So therefore we might expect that they sing more loudly uh, during the weekday when there's more traffic and maybe they have a lower amplitude on the weekend when there's less traffic. That's an example, right? So we have this sort of immediate flexibility. And there's really good evidence for this immediate flexibility, both in terms of minimum frequency and in terms of amplitude across a number of songbird species now. So we have both of these hypotheses. They're not mutually exclusive, but it's really important to think about the degree to which it the degree to which each of these may be explaining a particular pattern of behavior in any given songbird species. So I think all of this, hopefully at this point, and I might already have a convinced audience, this might be preaching to the choir, but that noise shapes animal communication and, and these terrestrial right, populations. And so we can see that it clearly has an impact on these behaviors. We see behavioral adjustments. We know um, it, that these adjustments can have fitness consequences, right? They're affecting uh, communication and male male and the ability to hold a territory and to attract a mate. Um, and we have some insight into how they might be doing this, right? Um, across a number of different songbird species. And so this is kind of, at least in my lab, this is where we were a couple of years ago. This is our understanding of how noise affects communication. But one of the things that we'd always struggled with is that to do this work, we had basically two types of experiments we could do. In the field, we could take speakers out on the birds' territories and crank the noise levels up and see how the birds responded, as long as they didn't fly away. <laughs> or we could bring them into the lab and artificially create these different soundscapes and look at how it affected behavior. But the one thing we couldn't do was to take noise out of the system, right? That was not possible until this happened, right? So COVID-19. Um, some people have called this a natural experiment or a very unnatural experiment, but however you might think about it, it happened, right? And it affected all of us globally, right? This is a huge, huge change in people's lives. And one of the first things that proliferated after this were these kinds of postings, these images that I have here on social media, where people were, in shock at seeing wildlife in places that they weren't used to see, right? So pictures of coyotes running down the, the street, um, of whales under the Golden Gate Bridge, right? So all of these postings. Now, of course, a number of them turned out to be fraudulent, right? <laughs> they weren't, or they're just animals that were really already there in the landscape. And people just because they were at home and maybe sitting a little more still than usual, noticed animals in their landscape that had always been there. Um, and so this to me was really interesting, of course, as a biologist was watching these postings. And it took me surprisingly long, I, had, I hate to, it took me a couple of weeks to realize, wait a second, if people are moving out of the landscape and animals are moving in, how is this affecting the soundscape, right? I was like, huh. So I started really looking for social media that talked about sounds. And what you found was people talking about bird songs, right? They said, wow, I hear so many more birds, or I hear birds I've never heard before. 
or bird song sound so much louder. And to me, as a sound person, I was like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because that cocktail party effect, if the party has wound down and it's quiet, they shouldn't be shouting anymore, right? They should actually be singing at a lower amplitude. So what, what's going on? And so there's sort of three ideas that came out of this. It could be that people are, are, are bored, right? I mean, that's probably the best case scenario uh, with the pandemic and that they're just paying more attention. We do see a lot of people becoming birders that weren't birding before. They may be out and just being uh, paying more attention. So it's quieter maybe, but they just are hearing the birds that have always been there. Or it could be that with sort of reduction in human noise, especially those low frequencies, that they can hear birds that maybe are tend to be more masked by noise. And so this, they're sort of being, I hate to say this, unmasked. Uh, and you can hear birds that have, again, always been there, but the birds themselves are not changing their behavior in any way. Now, a third possibility, and this is the one that would be really exciting to find, is that birds are actively changing their behaviors in ways to maximize the signal to noise ratio and maximize sort of their, um, their, their presence in the soundscape. So we could expect that there might be some behavioral adjustments in response to this new quiet. So I sort of had two primary questions here. Did movement restrictions of people actually result in the soundscape with lower anthropogenic noise levels, right? Everything is telling us probably so, but then again, the degree to which people paid attention to these lockdowns varied a lot. And, and to what degree that actually maybe affected the soundscape, we just didn't know. So we wanted to quantify that. We also wanted to know, do birds actually respond by adjusting their behaviors in ways that are gonna maximize this signal transmission to the distance at which the signal can be detected and discriminated, as well as the potency of that signal, right? It's use in functions such as male-male competition. So some of the predictions were that presumably if people were paying attention and they stayed home, there should be less traffic and that less traffic should lead to at least lower uh, background noise levels, maybe not ambient noise levels, but background noise levels, particularly at lower frequencies. And then if noise levels decline, we might expect birds to produce songs at lower amplitudes, right? And lower minimum frequencies, actually shift their song down to occupy that newly opened part of the soundscape. So I want to mention here, um, so this work is a long-term collaboration with David Luther, who's faculty at George Mason University. We've been working on this for a while now, um, and these kinds of questions of noise pollution and animal communication, uh, even before COVID. And this work has been uh, it's contributed to, and is, is, is a lot of the data that I'm gonna talk about here um, have been collected by sort of a whole bunch of different postdocs uh, and graduate students, almost all of whom are now actually faculty in their own right. <laughs> so um, they're not students anymore, but they're still, especially Jennifer Phillips here, uh, has become a long-term collaborator on this project as well as my brother, Graham Derryberry, who is a computer scientist and has helped, as you all know, sound files are large and it's a lot of data to process and he's been instrumental in processing these data. And actually my husband, Mike Blum, who for the first time we collaborated last year because he's a disease ecologist, but he also thinks about uh, coupled human, animal, human wildlife um, situations. And so had a really unique perspective of thinking about this context where this is the first time I was working on data from people. So he, he provided a really useful perspective on that component. And so our study system are the white crown sparrows, right? And so uh, we knew um, all these, the sort of background that I gave you, a lot of that was coming from our own work, which is that we've shown really well over the last 10 years that songs vary with noise levels. They vary um, with noise levels within cities and across even urban rural gradients, right? Because there's other sources of noise in natural landscapes, such as ocean sounds. We've also shown that these changes in song are salient in male-male competition. So changes in things like song amplitude and song minimum frequency matter. They have a, con they have a consequence for male-male competition. And our work has shown that developmental plasticity, so that process of cultural selection, seems to be a better explain, it appears to explain these patterns and behavioral variation better than immediate flexibility. 
In other words, when we make it loud on the male's territory, um, they do show a flexibility and amplitude. They, they sing at a higher amplitude, but they don't change their minimum frequency. Right? And so because of that, we weren't sure, right? our prediction about how minimum frequency would change in response to the new quiet of COVID, we weren't sure. Was it going to shift down and suggest maybe immediate flexibility, or is it going to stay consistent with our past work, suggesting that because this is cultural selection occurs across generations, that we may not see an immediate effect of changes in noise on animal behavior. So that was a, a big question for us. So our sampling, so our sampling, all of our work here is in, uh, near and around sort of uh, San Francisco, East Bay, and up into Marin County on White Crowns. We had a number of different uh, places that we sampled in urban areas, which are red, and in rural areas, which are here shown in blue. And we have data from a bunch of different years. In fact, we have songs all the way back from the 70s, but I'm going to focus today on sort of the the best collection of songs is 2016, it's because of my student Jennifer Phillips, her dissertation. She, within a very short period of time, recorded songs of males holding territories at all of these sites. And so we had this great pre-COVID data point, right? Our series of data points. And then during COVID, we were able to return and record at the same time in the same localities, giving us, you know, repeated measures, sampling. And on these territories, we recorded their noise levels, as well as songs. And I wanted to say here, I don't know if you remember, but I said that males tend to sing one song type, and most males in an area sing the same song type, but different populations have different song types. So across the sampling, we have four different song types. And what is nice about this is because these are sort of independent cultural populations. So they give us um, sort of a, a better sense of, of, ind sort of independent sampling to look at these behavioral adjustments. Now from these songs, we recorded both song uh, amplitude and the field, which is like, I'm sure everybody on this <laughs> knows that that is very tricky to do. Um, it's a lot easier in a singing bird uh, and, and especially white crowns. So white crowns are very helpful and that they tend to sing at about head height and you can get very close to them because they're very chill birds. So we're able to um, basically record in a way with uh, a Larson Davis that allows us to uh, very precisely align our recording uh, directly with their beak, the way that they sing, so we can get right alignment. And then we have to do things like measure how far we are from the bird and a number of other different things to be able to extract this kinds of information. And I'm happy to talk about more of that at the end. I don't go into great detail here, but essentially we're recording their amplitude in the field in real time on their territory, as well as the noise level at that time. And then we then take those same songs and from those songs, we create power spectra and measure the minimum frequency of those songs. Okay, so some data. So I'll start with data that are not collected by us. So these are Tom Tom data, but this is just a nice visual of the fact that it did people stopped using their cars, right? So before COVID, there's a lot of traffic indicated here in red. This is very believable. Anybody who's tried to drive um, in downtown San Francisco knows that it's a, it's a nightmare. <laughs> there's a lot of traffic. There's a lot, a lot of traffic. But during COVID, um, traffic went away. And that was really exciting. And here in gray is the, is the period of the strictest lockdown, um, the time period of the strictest lockdown. And then here boxed are the three weeks in which we did our recordings. So I wanna note here, like we were really lucky in some ways. I mean, if you can call a pandemic lucky, we were able to do this work because the shutdown happened right at the start of their breeding season, white crown squirrel breeding season in the city and that's when they're using their song right that's when their song is most important setting up these territories and attracting mates so the timing of it was was critical right to be able to look at this um it also you know just the fact that because we've worked in this area for a long time we could get permission to go in and report now we couldn't do anything else we weren't allowed to net or ban and you'll see that there was a lot of missed opportunities there for asking questions, but we were able to at least record these birds, um, which is the, the data I'm talking about today. 
So we found, not surprisingly, that noise levels are significantly lower. But the way that they're lower is interesting. So in this figure, I have on the x-axis, so this is our time point before COVID, so that's 2016. And during COVID, that's 2020. Um, this is the same uh, period of time. And again, these are noise level readings from individual male territories. Right? So these are not by roads. These are on the territories of singing males. And in blue are these rural males, so up in Marin. And in red are these urban males. And you can see that the urban levels, background noise levels, significantly reduced between those two time points. And they reduced on the order on average of about seven decibels. So we all know, right, it's on a log scale, 60 dB is a doubling of sound pressure levels. So this is a pretty significant, um, and I had to convince people, right, people like seven, that doesn't seem very big. It's like, well, that's big, right? That's a huge reduction in background noise levels. But what really got me excited is when we looked at the power spectra of this. So here we have these power spectra, we have frequency on the x-axis, um, background noise level on the y-axis. And so this is essentially showing us how power is distributed across these frequencies, right? And so um, we have four here. We have the in red is urban, blue is rural, dash is before, and solid is during. So as you can see in rural areas, right, that there is higher noise levels. Um, at lower frequencies, right? This is sort of the ocean surf, and the ocean didn't go away. So it's very similar looking. Um, although there are some changes, interestingly, um, which I'll talk about, I can talk about later, but there is a, a surprising similarity here. Um, we also see that uh, in urban areas, though, we see a big drop specifically at these lower frequencies, right? So this is essentially this noise reduction appears to be driven by a drop in energy level at low frequencies, which is probably traffic, right? We were able to look at some traffic data. So for example, from the Golden Gate Bridge, which is near one of our main places the, in the Presidio, and it's a toll bridge. And so because of that, we actually can show that traffic levels during COVID were at levels not seen since the 1950s. So traffic levels reduced by quite a bit. And not surprisingly, we see this big reduction in background noise levels. So what did the birds do? Well, interestingly, we found that they changed their songs. So in rural areas where background noise did not change, we see no change in song minimum frequency. But in urban areas, we see a significant reduction. That's about 160 hertz. That's not a huge change. Uh, it's, it's enough that the bird can discriminate. We've done a lot of playbacks to figure this out. Um, so this is a meaningful difference, but it's not a big difference, right? But we do see a reduction, right? It does get lower as we predicted. Now, if you remember, we weren't totally sure if we were gonna see this, right? And we didn't have birds identified. We didn't have them individually marked and we couldn't catch, capture them. So we couldn't really see to what extent this was immediate flexibility, right, or not. So there's two possibilities. Our past work suggests that these guys, at least in response to an increase in noise, don't adjust their minimum frequency. Now, when noise is removed, we see a decrease in minimum frequency. This could be because adults are actually showing immediate flexibility, and we just missed that at our work, right? It's something new that we didn't uncover. Or it could be that males with songs with lower minimum frequencies suddenly became more competitive in acquiring territories, particularly in these urban areas in 2020. And so that's an outstanding question, which um, we might be able to get at actually. But so I've got a team in the field right now. Uh, we're getting ready to report again for our, our you know, as uh, our, our second year out from the pandemic. And we're really curious to see if we can discriminate between these two questions. Now, one of the things about this uh, change in minimum frequency is that, of course, it also changes the bandwidth of the song, right? If you remember, if you increase minimum frequency, you're going to reduce the bandwidth of the song if you don't change maximum frequency. And we know that this can be uh, particularly salient in songbirds for a couple of reasons. So some great work in the 90s demonstrated that the way that songbirds produce these pure tones is by actively filtering out the harmonics that are produced in their series at the source. And the way that they do this is they change the, um, the, the vocal track, the shape of their vocal track. And so effectively, just to really simplify it, it's more complicated with this, but 
effectively what they do is that they open their bank more widely when they're producing high frequency sounds, which shortens their vocal tract kind of like a piccolo. And then when they're emphasizing lower frequencies, they close their beak making that vocal tract longer, more like a flute. And so when they're singing, they're actively opening and closing their beak to track the fundamental frequency of these notes. And so you can imagine doing that is um, uh, they, they can face some motor constraints. And the kind of motor constraints that they face is that they're only able to open and close so rapidly and widely. So if they're going slowly, they can produce a wide bandwidth song or a narrow bandwidth song. But if they start going really fast, they're necessarily reduced to a narrower bandwidth. And this results in a triangular distribution of songs such that we don't find songs up in this upper quadrant up here, right? We don't find songs that are both fast and wide bandwidth. And we can measure the distance of a song from this sort of upper bound regression, right? So if we have this red line as our upper bound, how far a song is is a measure of how um, well, a male is performing this trade off between trill rate and bandwidth. So, songs that are further from the line are lower performance. Songs that are closer to the line are higher performance. And we can take and ask males and females whether they care about this. And so, now in a number of songbird species, including white crowned sparrows, we've shown that this matters to birds, right? They discriminate and they prefer the males who sing a higher performance song. So, you can imagine then. If you're changing minimum frequency that and that changes bandwidth, it can have these knock on effects for vocal performance. It may limit the degree to which a male can sing the highest possible performance that he's capable of singing. And so we wanted to know whether vocal performance changed and it did. And in fact, it changed quite a bit. So we found that during COVID, um, the bandwidth of uh, urban songs specifically increased. You can see this red line going up. And they effectively had a similar bandwidth, the same as males in more rural areas. So they were achieving a bandwidth that we hadn't seen in urban populations since the 60s. So it's a huge change. And that resulted in an increase in vocal performance. In other words, the males got closer to the line. So we think of the line as sort of up above this minus 10. Um, the higher that point, the higher the vocal performance, the closer they are to that performance limit. And we see that there's an increase in both locations, both in rural and in urban, but there's the biggest increases in these urban males. And in fact, it's an 11 point increase. Now we know from all of our playback experiments that we've done over the years, that any increase over four points is functional. So males respond more strongly, right? That's a, a male with a, a higher performance song is better at holding the territory and attracting a mate. And if it's above four point, that's where they start to tell a difference. And we see an 11 point increase in these songs. So this is really a, a suggesting that these changes to their song in this one year at least had a big effect on the, the salience of that signal, at least in, in male male competition. So we also measured amplitude. Now the data here are not quite as robust because when we measured amplitude before COVID, we didn't have a whole lot of data points. We had, I think about 20 males that we recorded because we were still figuring out exactly how to do this in the field. Um, and you can see we were like, oh, this is not so easy. And so we recorded what we thought was about typical. It's between, you know, it's averaging 80 decibels at a meter, right? Um, which is pretty typical for a songbird. Now, during COVID, um, we worked harder to actually measure amplitude in all these males that we were recording because we couldn't do anything except record, so we just went for amplitude. And what we found is that on average, males were singing at a lower sound energy level. So what does this mean? So a couple of things. You can see here that this varies with distance from recordist, so we have to take into account how far you're standing. Essentially, the closer you are to the male, the quiet, more quietly he sings. Now, once we account for this, we can also see a signature of this Lombard effect, right? That's this, is, it, is the sound level, is the background noise levels drop, song amplitude also drops, right? And about 0.27 dB, right? So there's, there's some effect of the Lombard on this. Interestingly though, what we're calling the COVID effect for lack of a better word, is we saw a four decibel decrease in amplitude that we couldn't account for just based on distance from the recordist or the Lombard effect suggesting that noise is having, at least at the landscape level, is having what we 
otherwise had not detected to date effect on song amplitude. That's a, that's a pretty big effect. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what that could mean. So I'm, I'm open to suggestions and ideas on that one. Now, even though background noise levels dropped um, by about 7 dB, birds sang more softly only by about 4 dB. So that means effectively the signal to noise ratio doubled. But I like to say is this kind of brings us back uh, to Twitter, right? To people talking about how birds sounded louder. And I think that this could be the, ex the explanation. So before COVID, if you could hear a bird at about five meters, you could now during COVID hear them at about 10 meters, right? It doubled effectively the signal to noise ratio, thus effectively doubling the distance. What that means then, if you could hear this many birds before COVID, during COVID, you could hear effectively four times more birds, which might account for why, right, that they sounded louder, right? That they're singing more softly, but the signal to noise ratio is greater, and now you can also hear more birds. So that could explain uh, that effect. We also found um, for the birds themselves, this really affected their transmission, their communication distance. So before COVID, these quote unquote long distance signals were only going a little over five meters. And for anybody who studies whales, that's probably like really unimpressive. <laughs> it's also really unimpressive for a songbird. It means in the city, they're really suffering, right? There's noise pollution really having a major effect, significant effect on their communication distance. And that's really exemplified that during COVID, um, with that reduction in noise levels, we now see songs traveling at about 20 meters. That's, that's a, almost a tripling of their communication distance. That's a huge effect uh, for them. And if I can, I seem to have lost my cursor. I'm gonna try to see if I can play these files. So this is a recording near the Golden Gate Bridge. It's a little tinny because of Zoom. But you can probably just hear a male singing with the traffic. And then I'm going to play a recording from the same spot during COVID. Let's see if I can play it. Oh, no. Let's see if I can play it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds a lot louder, right? <laughs> so that's a male at about the same distance. There's still traffic. But now you can actually hear multiple males singing. So you can actually hear communication taking place, whereas before COVID, you could just hear that one male singing. So it's just a nice exemplar of this effect. So some of the new things, so some of our updates from our work from before. So we can see we knew noise affected amplitude, but now we suggest it's not just the Lombard effect. There's something going on at a landscape level. It could be due to things like social effects or predator detection. Um, we see that males, you know, we want to ask now that how do males distinguish between 2016 and 2020 songs, right? We see this big change in the song structure over a relatively short period of time. So sort of a next step that we're interested in. You know, this work really shook our uh, understanding of whether it was developmental plasticity or immediate flexibility that explained these changes in song minimum frequency. And so we're hoping that males that were born during the pandemic can help us solve this. So in this species, first year males actually have a different kind of plumage. They have delayed plumage maturation, so they have a brown crown. So we can actually go out and record males and tell which males were born last year. And we can see what they're singing. Are they singing the type of song that was prevalent in 2020? Or are they singing a song that's more typical of the past of when there's higher noise levels? Because it may be, if it's immediate flexibility, they're adjusting the signal. But if it's mainly cultural selection, we might expect their song to sound more like it did in 2020. So sort of big conclusion. So we see that behavior changes in response to noise, right? Um, and we think that this may be due to processes like cultural selection or developmental plasticity. But we see that reduced noise, right, unlike a lot of other types of pollutants, which is really nicely said in a recent paper that uh, a number of people on this call put out in science, is that what's cool about noise pollution is that unlike other pollutants, you can remove it really rapidly, right? And we can see potentially really rapid behavioral responses uh, in immediately, right? So it should, it should really motivate people. We like to have immediate gratification um, that here is something that we can do, we can modify in our world and have an immediate and positive effect on animal populations. 
And so this hopefully will help encourage sort of lasting remediation of noise pollution. Um, it could help things like demographic recovery of birds like white crowns that persist in cities, as well as maybe potentially lead to higher species diversity. A number of uh, ecosystem ecologists have shown that noise can actually exclude species from landscapes. So we could actually see a return of those uh, to these landscapes with reduced noise pollution. And so I'm really interested now and in our work that we're doing to see what happens. Is it, is it just as loud now as it was in 2016? Have the animals changed right back to what they had in 2016 in terms of their songs? Or are they on a new sort of cultural trajectory? Right? We're really curious to see what we find with our data this year. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Liz. That was um, a very interesting talk, and uh, you know, I had all kinds of questions uh, pop up in my mind uh, based on the things that you shared with us today. But uh, for any of those of you in the audience that have questions um, and you want to either put those in the chat box, uh, either myself or or uh, Liz or, or Jen can can uh, pick those out of there, or feel free to unmute and um, and ask the questions. And uh, so I'm happy to do stop share too, if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I'll have one to start here uh, for you, Liz. I was thinking about when you were talking about um, detection distances from a kind of a human psychoacoustic standpoint, but thinking of that in the, in the context of the, the you know, I, I don't know what's known about the sensory perception of the birds themselves, but if the transmission of signal transmission area, the, the active space of the signal has increased uh, because of lower uh, uh, noise levels, what potentially would that have, uh, how would that have affected the size of territories or the likelihood, the probabilities of attracting a mate, et cetera, all these kind of secondary or tertiary things related to, to the fitness of, of the signaling males? That's a great question. I love that you went right there because that's where my first year grad student went. She, when this, when this happened, she got really excited and she's actually the one out in the field right now. And she's mapping territories because we never done that. I don't know why we just sort of missed that angle. And she's like, oh man, this should, this should be, this, that's how, that's the first thing you think of as change in communication distance. So she's out mapping urban and rural territories. Um, I wish we could have done that <laughs> during COVID, um, but now we can still look at it and start to look at if there's a relationship between this communication distance and territory size. Do birds that have a larger communication distance also defend a larger territory? Or do they maybe have more song posts, right? Like if you have a small communication distance, maybe you have the same size territory, but you have to go to more spots to kind of maximize that active space. So that's the, that's the question of her thesis now. That, that's uh, fascinating to, to think about in terms of just a cessation of noise and changing these pretty important parameters of their life history, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it is. And we do know something about how they hear. So they don't hear well in noise. In fact, they hear probably about half the distance. Like if you can hear a bird singing the noise at about 10 meters, they can probably just, or you can just detect it at 10 meters, they could detect it at about five meters. So they're, they're actually harder of hearing the noise. And we have, we count, they have to account for that in our analyses of communication distance. Thanks, Liz. There, there was a write-in question, and then I have a question too. Okay. Um, so the write-in is, from Kai, could the proximity of a turnpike or to rural yard possibly increase the amplitude of, of our cardinals and song sparrows? So if I understand it correctly, I think it's saying that, do we expect birds to sing at a higher amplitude near to louder locations? I think that's I think that's the question. Yes, I think that's what I'm hearing. Sorry, it's hard to, <laughs> to translate sometimes. Um, so yeah, there is evidence in other songbirds, especially in cardinals. So my collaborator David Luther works on this in cardinals it's around Washington D.C. Um, and they do find higher song amplitudes when that are related to noise levels and. We do account, have to account for proximity. It doesn't seem to persist. So just because you're close to a road, if it's then quiet at that road, they drop their amplitude, right? So it seems it's the noise from the road more so than other related factors to that edge 
that explain that song that I think that might be answering the question, but feel free to, to respond, Kai. I have a separate question. I know you've only looked at songbirds, um, mm -hmm. but birds like seagulls or, or shorebirds that don't have song, would you expect to see the same type of patterns and trends that you're seeing now? Because you know, boats have definitely, and recreational activity during COVID down. Um, so I was just wondering what your hypothesis or thoughts would be for non-songbirds. Yeah, no, so I, I think that we would see, especially with amplitude, so the, the songbird effect is irrespective of how that song develops, right? Or the vocalization itself. So any kind of vocalization, I, I can't even think of a system where folks have looked for the Lombard effect and not found it. Hanrik Broom, um, who I mentioned, has looked pretty extensively. So my guess is that, yes, we would see a change in the amplitude of seagull vocalizations, their, um, their calls, you know, even though they're not a songbird. In terms of the actual frequency characteristics, they're probably less flexible. So at least in the work that's been shown, comparing a closer relative, so songbirds to the sub -ossings, so the ossings and the sub -ossings, which are close relatives that don't learn their song, they seem less flexible in the frequency characteristics. So my guess is that that's what you'd also see with things like terns and seagulls. Interesting. Um, I do have another question for you, Liz. Oh, there's a hand up too. Oh, do we have a hand up? Yeah, I think Michael Ainsley, if you want to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll turn on my video as well so you can actually see me. Hi. Um, hi hello. <laughs> Thank you for a fascinating <laughs> talk. It really was. I found it really interesting. And, 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 um, and thank you for explaining it so well to a non biologist. Um, I, um, I, I want to start by, by saying I, I'm. I, I live and work about 10 miles from Hans Leberkorn's lab, and I regret now not, not having mentioned to him that this was, this was going on, because I think he would have really enjoyed that as well. Um, yeah, he's very nice. He's been, he was very key in some of my early work, so yeah. Right, okay. Oh, and anyway, I shall certainly mention it to him next time, next time we speak. I have a question, though, for you about, about um, one of the, uh, the, 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 the well, one of your slides mentioned a four, a four times increase in the number of birds you can hear, and I couldn't understand where that factor four came from, because you, right. you, you mentioned a three dB increase in signal to noise ratio and converted that to a doubling of distance, and that's the part where I get lost. Where does the doubling of distance come from? Yeah, so, so there's a couple steps in that, sorry, and the, and the four times as many birds becomes like a back of the envelope kind of thing. So, if you think about the signal to noise ratio, so signal to noise ratio effectively doubled, right? Yeah. And yeah. if we look at how um, sort of people hear birds, then when we looked at this in terms of the communication distance or not this, or the detection distance for people, we found approximately a doubling, right? So that if you could hear it about five meters, you could now hear it about 10 meters. Right, so it doubled the distance of which, and if you just so that's, have, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but you're saying that's an empirical observation that it turns into yeah. doubling. Yes. Or so okay, okay, okay. Yes, I get so it. Okay, but then and then the, what happens is then I say okay, well, let's uh, describe a circle around us. Yeah, right? yeah. And say you can hear in that circle at a, about four birds, and now if you calculate the area of a circle at that yeah, yeah. ten meters, you're capturing. Okay. No, no, you, you answered the question perfectly. Thank you. That's very clear now. But okay. that leads to a follow-on question, which is why if, if why why does 3 dB lead to doubling in distance? Because I um if it was if it if it was spherical spreading, yeah. you would expect a doubling of distance to correspond to a six dB change in the yeah. noise ratio. So where does the extra distance come from? Is there something what is what is in there that's not that's departure that's yeah. causing a departure from spherical spreading that that then becomes my question. No, no. And so you're right. I was quick in how I said that. So on when, we, when I talked about the average change, so the average change in background noise level was about 7 dB, and the average change in amplitude was about a little over 4 dB. But if we calculated out the way we did for that on a per bird per territory 
what we find on average is actually a doubling, a 6dB change. So I have to go back and, and look at the numbers on how we did that. But it's, um, I think it's how we didn't, we looked at just in the city, if I remember correctly, and didn't also account for the rural birds. So that's a difference. So we did find a 6dB, we, saw, we found a doubling of that signal to noise, which would be a 6dB but it's, it's a little bit different from that average change. I mentioned from the models, the model predicted change. So that's why. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. So there's more, there's more to it than meets yeah, the eye. Yeah, that's, I, that's, that's you, that's it, I think it's all yeah. a supplementary. We spell but, it out a little better. But I, th I think there are other questions though. So I'll, I'll shut up now oh, and switch okay. myself up. Well, it's nice to meet you. But thank you. Yes, likewise. Thanks, Michael. I have one, one quick question and then we'll wrap up. I know a lot of folks have to <laughs> Uh, Sophia is asking Liz, uh, and this is kind of maybe gets what we're going to do in the future. Uh, do you think that more people maybe shifting to working from home post COVID may reduce the post COVID anthropony, the, the noise scapes, and insights that there might be more of a long term kind of shift in, in uh, male calling behavior, maybe even female choice uh, in the noise scape uh, moving forward? I kind of hope so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, our given site, given that San Francisco and a lot of its tech and a lot of tech companies um, were already kind of starting that shift to work from home and this really encouraged that shift. I imagine that we might actually see that in San Francisco. I can't say for sure. Um, and that's what we're measuring now. And we're hoping if we can do this, if we can kind of put the funds together to do it for a couple of years in a row, we'll have enough data points at that point to apply for like a long term. Um, and, and, and be able to measure that change over time and see if there's a persistent shift. Uh, but it's, it's a great empirical question that we're hoping to answer. Yeah, especially in context of the cultural selection piece that, uh, that you brought up that's uh, so unique for. for right. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today, Liz, and, and uh, <laughs> all of those that are still in the audience, thanks for, for, uh, for uh, being with us today. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to hearing more about this research moving forward. And uh, <clears throat> we'll post your talk on, on our CARE website and, and uh, uh, share it even more broadly. So thanks again, Liz, for being with us today. Great, thank you. Thanks for having me, it was really nice. Absolutely, thanks, bye-bye.